Great, so guten Abend, everyone, as we say in German, good evening, guten Abend. Um, great to have you and great to have Curtis over here. Thank you. Uh, great to have you guys, yeah, so uh, this is all about you and you, of course. And um, yeah, so I have piles, can you say that? I have piles, heartbeat, you know, I'm inside it. I'm a poet. So I'm really excited, and, and the reason why is um, let me tell you a little story. It's like about one and a half years ago, I think. Um, I just looked at my Facebook feed and I saw um, some, some really interesting shots, you know, they were kind of different, you know, a little bit offbeat. It was like, yeah, that's really interesting. Like, I've never seen stuff like that. And so I said, you know, I like it. Click on I like. So I followed, mm -hmm. started following. And uh, over the next couple of months, I followed and, and you know saw more amazing shots. And the person behind those shots, right, right. right. And um, so at some point, I, I still remember, like you were sick and in some remote area of, of the globe, hospitalized. Um, I think you had um, lung problem, maybe. Lung, yeah. Right. And like you said, like you know, I'm, I'm sick. I can't post any pictures. You know, and my family is coming, so I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm not well. And so I wrote and said, like, well, um, so get better soon. And, you know, um, once we recover, you should really come to Berlin. Um, because you are creative. Berlin is creative. And, you know, I'm creative. I'm an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, the most invited. So I was, like, one of, like, hundreds of people saying, like, get, get well soon. And he actually replied. He said, like, so who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we started chatting. And, and uh, we did a couple of Skype calls. And, together with uh, Curtis, um, and you know, at first, like, you had no idea, like, who I am, right, so, like, you, know, you had Curtis check me out, it's true, <laughs> yeah, right? so, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, right, because I, um, we spoke to Yahoo before, you know, I was with Yahoo, and so they reached out to, to the Yahoo folks in Silicon Valley, and said, like, this crazy German guy, Alex, said, you know this guy, and they said, yeah, talk to him, talk to him. <laughs> so we started chatting, and um, kind of long story short, um, he's here. Yeah. So that was the initial idea. And um, yeah, so you're an amazing artist. Um, you, know, you have some, some amazing shots, and we'll see a few later on. Um, if I understand correctly, you have 16 million followers um, following your work. Um, you've produced about 130 billion page views on Facebook alone, or like, you know, views on your work. Um, you know, and, and 60 million followers is more than Justin Bieber, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so like, that, that's pretty amazing. And personally, uh, I'm touched today because you've really inspired me. You know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I look at myself as an artist because I'm, I like to build companies, and I really like to work with the best people um, that also inspire me. And I, I spent a good chunk of time looking at your pictures over the months, basically. So I'm really glad that you're here. The stage is yours. Trevor. Right, right. <laughs> right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, new friend and old friends alike. Um, I really relish the opportunity to get to know you guys tonight. Um, let's get all chatty after this. I'm I'm the nicest guy in the world. I'm happy to talk about anything, so just bring it on, okay? Um, so tonight I'm going to surprise you. You know, I think people like they like to have plans, they like to know what's going to happen, but I don't think that's true. I think people secretly like to be surprised. So I'm going to surprise you tonight, maybe in some of the things I say and some of the things I show you. And I'm also going to challenge you. Um, let me go ahead and end... The overall feeling that I want to go for tonight, I'm going to kind of spoil it for you right now. I'm not going to build up to an ending and a surprise you. I'm just going to tell you right now. The greatest gift you can give to yourself, the greatest creative gift you can give to yourself, is the complete dissolution of the ego. The complete removal of the ego will do wonders for you. It'll improve. It'll improve your, your 
life with your loved ones or relationships. It'll make life easier with your friends. It'll make your life easier with the world at large. You know, I don't want this just to be like the trade show, right? I want it to be about all of us, like we're all in this together, right? And I want it to be about you. I talk to a lot of creative people. I help people kind of unlock their creative potential. And whether you're not creative and you want to be creative, or whether you are creative and you want to be more creative, flow state, staying that flow state longer, how do you do it? Well, chipping away at that ego and the eventual removal of it all the way, it removes energy blockages in you, and it can flow through you effortlessly, and you can be very focused and create amazing things. You may know people in your life where things bother them. Everything is bothering them. They're complaining things bother them. Things are getting stuck inside of you. You've got to remove all those blockages so things can flow. Can you imagine going the entire day and not letting anything bother you at all? How awesome would that be? It's just nothing bothers you. Curtis knows this about me. Nothing bothers me. It bothers him and nothing bothers me. <laughs> right? That's the only thing you have to deal with. But it's great. I have like unlimited universal energy available to me. I've got this tingly spider sense all the time. I'm very sensitive. I'm extremely empathetic. And this makes it very easy to create. So, question now, how do you get rid of this ego? What are some exercises you can do? So I want you to do a, a thought experiment with me. Go ahead and press play on this little uh, thing, little slideshow. So let's play about 10 slides of the stop on one. This is unrelated to what I'm saying. I know you guys are a smart enough crowd, you can have two concepts in your head at once. It's a wonderful human thing we can do. How, so what is an exercise I want you guys to do tonight, sort of a challenge? Okay, so I'm going to say things tonight that might evoke things inside of you. Maybe you'll see a photo that might evoke something inside of you. It will remind you of something. It will remind you of a memory, maybe a, a good memory or a bad memory. And you might get kind of caught in that thought for a while, which is fine. When this happens, try this challenge with your brain. Remove yourself from the thought and just observe it. Realize that you're the silent awareness behind all the thoughts. You're the sweet little bubble of self. And think of the thoughts that pass in front of you like clouds. Don't judge the clouds. Just observe them. You've never seen a poorly shaped cloud, have you? Just a thought. Just observe that it went by, okay? And then suddenly you're, you'll realize that you're... Someone's getting a call. Your wife is calling. Tell her that she was calling the first time. Actually, you can just maybe unplug my my audio jack for a minute. Yeah. All right. Don't worry, got the best crew in the business back here. Um, she wants you to bring on the bill. Yeah. So, um, as this happens, uh, just realize, so like, oh, I just had this thought. Isn't that interesting? That my mind generated this thought. Okay, and then, okay, you'll see, start listening to what I say again. You'll see something else. Another, another set of thoughts will come up. Maybe not even what I'm related, not related to what I'm showing you. Maybe it's like, Oh, I need to pay the electric bill, or I really need another drink, or whatever it is, right? Just like, oh, isn't that interesting? I had that thought. Don't judge it. Just be the awareness, that soft, sweet awareness that you know is you behind the thoughts. You're more than the thoughts in your head. You're the softness behind it all, okay? So just as you begin to notice this more and more throughout the day, you start to realize that these thoughts are blockages and they're getting stuck, right? Just let them go. Let go of this story that you're telling yourself you'll have access to this infinite sea of energy that is out there, okay? But by the way, if you guys do want another drink, just get up and get it any time. It won't bother me at all, really. I, plus, some of the things I say might make more sense. Uh, more um, so, uh, before we can start a little art show here, I'm going to show you a bunch of art, and I'm going to show you like a bunch of different ideas that I've been working with over the past 10 years. Eventually, this will lead up into our fine art series that we've recently released. Uh, so I thought it might be interesting to kind of show the culmination of all these various things, and why did we end up releasing 21 works that are meaningful to me. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank some people. Um, of course, I want to thank Curtis. Um, Curtis is my right-hand man. Um, he does a million little things behind the scenes that you guys don't even know about, but I know about. Uh, I think it'd be tough for a lot of people to be best friends and work together so closely, uh, but I think we pull it off just because we're pretty awesome together. It's a rare thing, so I really value that. 
Um, I also want to thank Samuel for setting all this up. It's a lot of work, and he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. We're visiting these 10 great cities across Europe next year. I'm very excited about that, so thank you, Samuel. And I also want to thank Alexander. It's been incredible. Uh, great getting to know him and his friends in Munich this week and here. This is his lovely wife. I'm honored. Um, and then also, I want to thank some of our patrons uh, that make all this possible. I have corporate partners, corporate patrons. Um, Google and Rick Carlton, who are here tonight. Uh, they do tremendous things, and I think it's it's not for you know new art collectors, experienced art collectors, uh, corporate partners, and patrons. Like a lot of the art that you see out there nowadays would not exist. You know, it's uh, it's tremendous what they've been able to do for us, and I really. I really value them very much. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> By the way, when we come back through Berlin next year, this is definitely one of the 10 great cities we're going to hit in Europe. Uh, the after party will be at the Ritz. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> Get ready. Okay, so uh, let's, let's jump to the next slide here, Curtis. Okay. I have to tell Curtis when to jump slides because my clicker won't go that far. So yes. Now, um, a lot of people, this is going to be like an art, artsy kind of talk, right? Um, but I notice, which is very interesting, a lot of people like wonder, like, what is your business? Like, how do you make money on a blog? Uh, what's going on? And who pays you? Do you have clients? This is a common question, right? And it's fine. I'll kind of address these things in the beginning. And then we'll kind of get into the arts and stuff. Because I, like you guys, I can put on both hats. I'm going to put on the businessy hat for a second. Okay, what do we do? So we'll jump to the next slide here. Kimasabi, we have a fine art business. Uh, we do art and creative education. Um, very briefly, my background is computer science and math. I just study. I had an IT job at Anderson Consulting, which is now called Accenture, so I work in Cubes. Did programming, then I went up to management. Um, pretty boring. You know, IT, I was smart, right? I was clever. Clever people get rewarded every year, and you kind of get stuck in this, this world, which is fine. It's not the end of the world. I didn't hate my life, but I knew it wasn't really creative. There's always this gentle throbbing in the back of my head, like, you were meant to do something else. You were meant to do something else. And then when I turned 35, I was very entrepreneurial. I tried different, several different companies. I, when I turned 35, which was 10 years ago, I got my first camera. And I fell in love with photography. I was traveling around. I was totally self-taught. I never read a book. I didn't know the rules. That's why I broke so many. Um, I loved it. I loved it. And immediately, I was so excited by this kind of photography that I was discovering called HDR photography, or high dynamic range photography, that I shared everything with the world. And I loved sharing, and people started coming to the blog, and ended up becoming a popular thing. So none of this was by design. It was all by beautiful accident. I can look back now and connect the dots. I've got a lot more stories around that to tell, but this is sort of an accidental life for me. When you look at it now, it looks like a grand plan, but I just piece it together as I go. There's no rule book for it just like there's no rule book for life. Uh, we do design partnerships. Um, um, one example of a design partnership is we've designed our own HDR software um, with Mac Fun, who's one of our partners. Um, actually, the new version just came out like five hours ago, so we've been busy today. Uh, the first version that came out is still only for the Mac, and it has over 750,000 downloads. So it's been hugely successful, and we expect even more for this one and even more when we make the Windows version. So, kind of like I was sick of using other people's um, software, I decided to make my own, right? And we teamed up with a team that really knew what they were doing. These genius Ukrainians, they're great. They want to take on Adobe. They're giant killers, which I love and respect. So we partner up, we like, we got to be partners with you guys. Great partnership. Another design partnership is with the great Peak Design and the amazing Alish is here. How are you doing? Good. These guys are incredible. I don't know if you've seen these bags I carry around. I give them all the credit in the world. It's an amazing company, incredibly disruptive. Again, they're taking on all the biggest bag companies in the world and completely destroying them. <laughs> in fact, it's the second biggest Kickstarter, all the bags put together in the history of mankind, only behind the Pebble Watch. I mean, like, what, 14 million bucks, 13 million bucks? 
something like that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's in the teens. Uh, it's just the beginning. We love those guys. We really value their our relationship. We always try to over deliver. I think it's because my parents were divorced at an early age, and I'm kind of a people pleaser. But we love our partners. They're incredible. So we do design partnerships. Um, we do brand partnerships. The next one uh, with like Google, Ritz Carlton, these kinds of people. Um, kind of lifestyle kinds of brands. We've kind of decided not to partner with camera companies, but kind of more go the kind of Formula One kind of level. So have lifestyle kind of things, that things that I think are cool and I do anyway. So it's a very natural relationship. Okay, one more thing before we get to story time, because I'm not going to talk about this, because I don't want to be all businessy. But we do have our own startup, which is a natural extension of what I do as an artist. Our main business, um, Stuck in Customs, it does well. It's a, it's a multi-seven-year, seven-figure business. Pays the bills, plenty, just fine. Well, we feel like we really cracked the nut on photography education, okay? We think that photography education is fundamentally broken, okay? Whether it's bricks and mortar, people that just go pay, you know, $50 a month to watch videos online, these are all just pretty lame, situations for teaching photography. Um, we have a totally new system. We started about a year and a half ago. It's called the Arcanum. And what we've done is we brought back the master and apprentice style of teaching, which is, of course, the pinnacle of teaching for most of history before it got ruined by mechanized education. And so I want to see every university that teaches creative education fall away, and we want to replace it with our much better system. Currently, there's about $6 billion spent on photography and visual arts education. It's spent incredibly inefficiently, and it's a huge disservice to the students. We know this because we've had to deprogram so many people and teach them the right way to do it. So this is sort of the magnum opus that we're, we're working on. So if you want to talk about that stuff, Dr. Me and Curtis offline. I could talk about that all day. But now we're going to talk about our story time. Next. So recently, I spent a month in Antarctica. Um, I was invited down by the New Zealand government. It's hard to get down on the mainland. You can take cruises down there, but to go stay on the continent is very difficult. We spent about five days out in the dry valleys. This is on the main continent. This is our tent here. Uh, back in the distance, you see the Taylor Glacier. It's amazing, because they don't melt there. They just stay there. Um, to give you a sense of perspective, from this tent, it's about a four hour walk to the glacier. And when I walked over there, this is what I saw. It was really close up, huge. You can walk right up and touch them. Um, there's really no cleaving that happens there, so it's totally safe. And I walked for hours along this, just taking pictures. Incredibly serene. Next photo. Sorry, mine are away. It's all right. And scene. <laughs> oh, that was a double go. Yeah. Um, the first night there, we had to go through survival training and survive outside. Of course, it never gets dark there. This was taken about 2 a.m. And we had to build our own kitchen. Use a saw to cut ice blocks. Um, you had to build a kitchen because it was so windy, you couldn't cut your food otherwise. You couldn't get an open flame going. Um, but basically, it's like Minecraft building all this stuff. It was really fun, <laughs> super exhausting, um, and it's really hard to move around because you're in all this emergency weather conditions gear. It's very difficult, but great fun. Okay, next. Um, this is a cool place. Very difficult to get to. This is in Death Valley, and these rocks mysteriously move across the desert. And people have observed this for hundreds of years, and no one has ever really been sure how it works. And so we live in a world, I took this at midnight, by the way, I was there totally by myself. And I would look at all these rocks, and I tried to figure it out. I could Google it ahead of time, right? You can Google anything nowadays. Only, I only Google about 70% of my questions. The other 30% I wonder. I think it's really important to, you. You must have something in your brain, some kind of like wonder organ, right? Like a kid has. That comes up with just crazy shit. Like, how could that possibly happen? You know, kids say the craziest solutions when they're wondering, like, where did that come from? I think as grown ups, we get so used to knowing the facts and just Googling everything that our, our wonder organ has kind of shriveled up to like a raisin's eye. 
and we, we stop wondering about things. So I went here with no a priori knowledge about how these things work. I just wanted to figure it out. I never did. I eventually did look up the solution on, on YouTube, and it's fascinating. But I think it's good to wonder. That was, uh, that's the moon right there. I love this photo. Okay, next. This is a, another hard place to get to. Uh, this is in Namibia, called Cullen's Kump. And it was old, I think that's a German word, isn't it? Yeah. I probably said it wrong, I apologize. Cullen's Kump. Oh, it might be a little off. You can Google it. Uh, <laughs> oh, wonder. Don't wonder if I said it wrong, I'm not Google it. Uh, this is a mining town. It was abandoned in the 70s or 80s as sand dunes started to sweep over the town. So now it's a ghost town. There's dunes everywhere. It's really, really interesting. It's a nice sort of study on order versus chaos. Next. This is the old, original part of the Great Wall of China. Uh, most Great Wall of China shots we see are like a recreation. They're kind of like a Disney-fied thing, which is sort of sad if you think about it. But all the trees are growing up on here. There's game trails on here. There's birds. There's animals that run all around. It's super dangerous, but very fun. OK, next. Uh, I was invited to the launch of the final two space shuttles by NASA. And uh, I was up there on the front row. You can't get any closer than three miles. And it's one of these situations where there's probably 5,000 photographers lined up, you know, and they've been doing this stuff for years, you know, since the Apollo missions. And they've got all these giant lenses, and they're all talking really serious to each other. It reminds me, like, what a serious profession. So many professions are, how seriously people take themselves. But especially these old school photographers, and I was like, I don't know what's going on here. And um, so anyway, I had my big old camera, I was taking photos all, all the time with my Nikon, and then it started buffering. And at the last second, I had an extra camera, a 50 millimeter prime, and I talked that one shot as it got sucked up into the cloud. And this became the number one shot of that launch. It got something like 25 million retweets and all this stuff went all over the world. Whereas all these other, they, they, were, they were just like regular photos of a rocket taking off. Um, to me, this is much more interesting because you're not sure what the heck's going on, right? I think it's important to have some mystery in your photos. I study a lot of painters. One of my favorites is Renoir. He, he purposely engineers mistakes and mysteries into all his paintings. Nowadays, our cameras are so good, even an iPhone, that when you take a photo of something, it becomes quite literal. It's all perfectly defined. You can see everything. There's no mystery in that. So it's counterintuitive that you have to remove information in order to make it more interesting. But it's true. Okay, next. This is in Guilin, China. Um, these are these uh, coromont birds, that bird down there. And what the fishermen do is they tie a little string, a little ring around their neck, so they can, they can swallow small fish, but not big fish. So they dive in near where the water, where the light is, because the fish are attracted to the light. They catch it. The fisherman pulls the fish out of the beak and then puts it in that basket behind him. Okay, next. Uh, this is in Zhongjiajie, China, down south. It's really hard to get to, uh, but a beautiful place. I went up and down these fires like four times one day. I was exhausted. Uh, extremely dangerous, very slippery. I probably shouldn't have done it. My mom always gets really nervous on <laughs> these things. Uh, but this is the same place that gave James Cameron the idea for Pandora and Avatar. Of that movie. Next. Um, this is like a little trade travelogue area. Um, this is the coolest temple I've ever been to. I've been to a, a lot of temples, and I mean a lot, and I love them. Um, this is in Bang this is in Thailand near Pattaya. Um, there's, there's a series of three shots here. So I saw this, it started to get dark, and I kind of snuck down to the trees to go inside. It was all closed. So the next shot is uh, the entrance to it. Um, incredibly ornate. Uh, I've never seen anything so ornate. It was just ridiculous, the carvings and everything. And then I went up inside, and this is what I saw. The most amazing thing about this temple, prepare for mind blowing, is this only started being built in the mid-1980s. It's one of the newest temples in the world. It was built by this crazy rich guy in Thailand. What's also interesting is all five major religions 
are represented equally inside. It's incredible if you look at it. It's just amazing. We can keep going. If you're into religious iconography, you can just sit there and look at all these things that are happening. It's really interesting. Uh, this is in uh, Botswana. It's actually with Curtis. Uh, we don't do many workshops, uh, but we try to make them incredibly awesome. Uh, so this is one we did in Africa. We took about 15 people with us. Uh, we, we tracked her for probably over a week. We finally found her. She was she had dragged a warthog up a tree and was eating it. And she didn't really like us being there, as you can tell. This is in Dubai, uh, one of my favorite cities. Um, we have a good contact with the royal family there. So they, they got me up on top of this building. This picture is a picture of me taking this photo. Um, so that's the Burj Khalifa, which is about a mile high. In order to get no distortion on it, I need to be about exactly the height as the middle of it. So that's where that is. I'm usually not that much of a daredevil. I, I'm not one of these like extreme photographers. I'm kind of a scaredy cat, really. Uh, but sometimes you just, you got to medium photography, medium format photography. Um, you go to the next one. Uh, so this is all, these are all taken with the Hasselblad, uh, which I love. These are my two little girls. Uh, that's Scarlett on the right and Isabella on the left. Um, we recently took a 30-day uh, trip across five countries. We started in Thailand, and then to India, and then Oman, and Qatar, and then Italy. I kind of want to introduce my kids to the uh, you know, great religions of the world, right? Or as many as we could across those countries. Um, and so it was just amazing. They, they learned so much. I, we love dressing them up in all the little outfits and everything. Of course, they love dressing up with little girls. I love this photo. Okay, next. Um, this is in Venice. I'll go to the next one. So I don't know if you guys know much about medium format photography. I'm coming to learn it myself. I think if I had gone to art school or photography school, like like real photographers, then I would know more about medium medium format photography, and I could speak to it. So of course, naturally, it's a four by three resolution. That's what the sensor is like. You guys know that I do process a lot of my photos. In fact, that's kind of, kind of how I became known because I have this unique version of high dynamic range photography. But I don't process all my photos. This is basically right out of the camera. And I think it looks amazing. Very simple photo. Um, this is the train we took across India as a family. Um, had a great time. If you ever go to India, I do recommend one of these high-end trains. They're amazing. You have your bedroom, your home base, um, and you get to see places you would normally never get to see. It's great. Okay, next. Um, this is in Venice at Carnival. This is taken, I think, with a 90 millimeter F4 on the Hasselblad. Um, incredible bouquet. Bouquet is that area behind that's out of focus. It's a very uh, photographer thing. Photographers. You know, I, I know, and I've talked to some of you guys. You can go to the next one. Uh, I've talked to some of you guys, and I know there's a lot of like photographers of various levels in here. And it's great, isn't it? It makes you wonder, like, what did we do before we took photos? And I, I look around at other people traveling, I'm like, why aren't you taking photos? What are you doing? <laughs> are you just looking at things? Yeah, I love, I love it. I don't know what I did before. This is Devil's Staircase. Um, this is um, not far from where I live. I live in Queenstown, New Zealand. I moved there about four years ago with my wife and three kids. I'm an older boy. He's 15. And we love it. We love it. Uh, next. This is in Abu Dhabi. Uh, beautiful mosque there. Next. Uh, another one from Venice. This is a textured shot. I'm not going to show you many of these tonight, but this is one of my favorite techniques. Um, I apply sometimes 10 to 20 different textures on the shot, depending on the mood. Uh, next. Welcome, welcome, by the way. Feel free to get a drink. Um, take one for all you guys. It, it really won't bother me if you want to jump up and get some. Not at all. Um, this is a cool place. This is in Muscat, Oman. Um, these guys are security, and you might think I'm in trouble. I do get in a lot of trouble. Um, I've been arrested in, in China for flying my drone over the Forbidden City. I got a lot of trouble in India with the military police. So I'm always, whenever I see security, I just have this guilty feeling in the gold gut of my stomach. But what was really happening there is that they were getting my Instagram information so we could be Instagram friends. <laughs> All right, next. Really nice guys. Um, this is another 
good example of a medium format photo. You can tell these just have something else about them, right? There's an immediacy, not necessarily that they're sharper or better or anything, but there's something else happening with the compression in the photo that I am still trying to get my head and words around. I like to think I'm someone that's pretty good at wrapping words around concepts that are otherwise difficult to comprehend, but I don't quite get at the verbiage to explain what's happening here. This is on the very southern tip of India where three seas meet. Tremendous wind, tremendous waves. It's a huge statue that's bigger than the Statue of Liberty. It's just like totally Game of Thrones land. Okay, next. I was talking about Burning Man. Okay, another influence that's kind of getting us up to this fine art thing. Um, so I've been going to Burning Man every year for the last seven years in a row. Just got back about three weeks ago. I've got the next photo, Curtis, please. Um, this is one of my favorite sculptures there. This is called Embrace by one of my favorite artists there. His name is Matt Schultz. This is it burning down. Um, I think they spent about $300,000 to build it. It only stood for four days, and then they burned it down. A lot of outsiders would ask, like, well, why would you just burn all this stuff down? It's so expensive. Well, of course, it is a study of how ephemeral everything is and how everything changes, especially love. Next. This is one from this year. There are these art cars that travel the playa, probably a hundred art cars. Everything is free there, there's no money, it's a gifting, kind of libertarian paradise. And these are these five teapots that drag behind one another, you can climb up inside and have tea and watch the desert go by, have some vodka, whatever you want. Um, this is the temple this year, uh, one evening at sunset, beautiful. So kind of, every year it's different. It's a non-denominational temple. Uh, people go there and they uh, they write down things they want to forget. They put pictures of you know relatives that have passed away, pets that have passed away. They write very personal things. It's really like you cannot go there. Like even if you're the toughest son of a gun in the world, you cannot go there and not cry. I mean, just like little things, mm -hmm. little things. Like. I can very, I, I do go in there because I, I like you know I can immerse myself in the sadness. But like little things, like someone wrote like with a, a martial art pen, um, like nobody loves me. And someone wrote like I do, and they put a little arrow up to it. It's really nice, you know, stuff like that. I'm sure you think about. It. So um, this is another new thing from this year. Um, it's called Earth. I revisit these during the day, during the night and just try to capture them in different ways. You know, I feel like there's so much original art out there and mine is just like a derivative work. Uh, but I do my best to try to pay tribute to what they're going for, right? Uh, next. Um, this is something new I'm experimenting with. Okay, I took this photo about four years ago. Um, this is the temple burning behind her. This is something called a plotograph. P-L-O-T-A graph. It's a new technology. And this was made out of a single JPEG. It's a new way to take any single photo and animate it. It's incredible. Okay? If you come to my website, search plotograph, you'll find more. I have many examples of it. Um, in fact, uh, Alexander just spent time with one of the founders of it uh, last week in, uh, in Pits and Pretzels in Munich. Um, really interesting technology. I love it. And you know, I, I don't know what it means. I I think a lot about the way we store images and scenes in our head. Like our brain doesn't really store JPEGs. You know, we're used to our iPads running JPEG, JPEG, JPEG. The brain doesn't work like that. It remembers moments, doesn't it? And to me, this is a little bit more of a moment feel to it. Mm -hmm. This is the only one of these I'll show you. I've got a lot more I can show. You. Okay, next. Let me show you a few people shots from Papua New Guinea. Okay. I love people's shots. I don't, I don't uh, publish a lot of them, but I do a lot. Okay. Um, wonderful tribe. These, these are all uh, headhunters from different tribes all over, um, all over Papua New Guinea. Uh, next one. These are some pygmies, with bow and arrow. Uh, next. Uh, we got to hear all their songs. Um, I was there with one of my other BFFs named Renee Smith. 
Um, he's, a, he's another good guy to travel with. Positive energy, always happy, never draining, loves to take photos. Uh, okay, next photo. Uh, each tribe is, of course, marked by the way they decorate themselves so they can tell themselves apart when they get into serious situations. These are the mud men. Um, rumor had it that they were chased away by their by some competitors and they went down into a mud bank and covered themselves with mud so they could escape with nobody noticing them. Um, they sharpened their teeth. It's pretty serious stuff. Next. Uh, this is an all-female tribe. I don't want to mess with them too much. Uh, uh, yeah, really interesting, beautiful people. Um, this one, <laughs> this was a headhunting tribe, and as long as you stood your ground and you didn't fight back, then you were welcomed in. Um, that was a that was quite a day. And next, this is uh, my best friend Renee. <laughs> um, you know what? It's amazing. People always say like, "Well, how do you take photos of people?" Or how do, like, you guys can see I'm very smiley, I'm very open-hearted, just full of energy, and people can detect this sort of stuff, right? Especially in foreign places like this, where they're very connected to the land, and very connected to each other, and they don't have a lot of these filters that we put on in the normal world. They can just tell we're harmless and fun loving. All right, now let's talk about the fine art prints. Okay, I'll just show you a few of them here. We've selected um, 21 of these works, um, and what we do. This is the first one you might remember. Um, what we do is we only print three of them. One, two, three, and then they're gone. Okay, like this one, for example, there's been two of them sold. There's one left, and then what a lot of collectors do, maybe there's collectors in here, you know how this works. Is that since there's only three, they have resale values and only three, and they end up selling them to other art collector friends, and then they keep the delta. We don't get any of that, but that's okay because it raises the overall value of all. Uh, next, um, this is in Yosemite. Uh, next, I'll show you one of our collectors. He bought about 10 different works. This is one of them hanging. Uh, next. Uh, this is in um, uh, Tekapo, not far from my home in New Zealand. Go to the next one. In this case, he and his wife both loved this one so much, they bought, uh, they bought two of them. Um, one of them, they, of course, bought the hang. The other one, they just hang out with the certificate for in case they want to resell it later on. Uh, we have all of our work printed in Dusseldorf, actually, uh, at the same place that Andreas Bersky has his work. You have to be invited to print there, which is, so it's pretty serious stuff. So I've been to Dusseldorf multiple times to double check the prints, make sure the quality is good, all that sort of thing. Yeah, I love Dusseldorf too. Next. So here's a few others that are from this fine art series. Uh, this is New York City. Um, I was uh, walking to go give a speech one day. And I, I had uh, my assistant Luke with me, and I thought, okay, Luke, let's do this. I have a weird idea. You walk forward, um, and I'll, I'll hold your hand. You make sure you don't hit anything. I just want to look up. Okay, so I just like looked up for hours, and then eventually I saw this. I'm like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I took a photo of it. Okay. By the way, in my images, I do, without apology, manipulate them. Okay, but mostly to um, accentuate one thing or another. I don't add things. I don't like add a moon into a photo, or I don't like paint buildings on top of each other. I don't do any of that. This one is also manipulated. Some of you may tell it's been inverted. Okay, but that's about the extent of what I do. I thought the rocks underwater felt like stars. This was a study of water in four forms. There's the water itself, there's water in the air, there's the fog, there's the snow, the clouds. This is down in Milford Sound, the fjords on the South Island of New Zealand. Of New Zealand. Uh, these are ice folds in Antarctica. Uh, basically, these change every day. So I would visit these ice folds every day to see them in different shapes. And this is my, my favorite set of shapes. Reminds of humans how we change a little every day. Uh, this is Kowloon, China, which is on the opposite side of Hong Kong. The growth mm -hmm. rate is amazing. I love the patterns and colors here. I could talk about each of these routes. This is in uh, Inland Cargill. This is the Aurora Australis, which is the Aurora that's on the southern half of the equator. Next. Um, this is in Yangshuo, China. I always feel like the China, the building, everything's just trying to catch up with the mountains. 
It's like it's a, they're, they're all racing up there together. Next. Uh, this is in, uh, this is in Milford. Love this photo. Love it. There's lots of stuff going on here I can talk about. Um, Iceland. Um, all these prints are quite big. Uh, they're kind of two meters, three meters across. So they uh, kind of like a museum gallery style. And next. This is very close to my home. This is in Glenarchy, New Zealand, which is not too far from Queenstown, New Zealand. Next. Uh, this is also from Antarctica. It's hard to see this because it's small, but it's printed out at three meters across. You actually see there's thousands of penguins way at a distance. You can zoom land on their beaks. But over on the right side is where they hunt to get fish and sometimes get attacked by orcas. Over on the left side is a freshwater lake where they go get their water. So they go back and forth, and that's their little ecosystem. I've watched them for an entire day. Endlessly fascinating to watch penguins. Uh, this is actually a deconstructed, uh, pixelated texture that's happening here. Next. Um, you know about this one that's in our series. Um, this is Mount Erebus, the southernmost active volcano. I took this from the cockpit of a US CL-130. It's a, it's a normal cargo plane, but it's been adopted with skis on the bottom. Next. Um, and this is in Kyoto, Japan, one of my other favorite photos, so peaceful. It had rained earlier in the day and the mist was falling down as the sun came out. Incredibly peaceful. One of my favorite photos, this is uh, it's a Museum of Evolution. This is actually made out of 250 separate photos, a very detailed panorama, so you can like zoom in and see the taste buds on the giraffe. Uh, but like endless fascination to let your eye play around with this. Okay? So, um, this is all our contact information right here. Um, you can ask uh, you know, Curtis or Alex or Samuel, they can get you all this same kind of stuff. Um, if you want to talk to them about any of our, our fine art, we, we, love, we love new collectors that kind of keeps the love going. We, we would love to talk to you about that. Um, we have a gallerist in New York that takes care of all that kind of stuff. So that would be, that'd be great. Um, and we're also, you know, any, we're up for anything, right? Um, life is short. We like to do fun stuff with fun partners. Um, the most amazing stuff comes out of the woodwork. Um, you know, we're just like, whatever, bring it on. Okay, now I'm going to end with showing you a little movie time. We we'll jumped a little movie time here. Yeah, I'm yeah. just going to say that I'll, I'll have Samuel distribute that information so nobody has to write it down. Okay, yeah. good thing. Yeah, I'll tell you a little story here before movie time. Movie time. Want to tell a story? Yeah, I'll tell a story. <laughs> yeah. Actually, can you turn off that light that's hitting the screen so it's extra dark? Well, I tell the story. Okay. This is a sad story. Not to bring the mood down too much. We're all so happy. But we're going to take a short ride on the sad train. Yeah, that's okay. Friends. We're friends. Sorry, I... okay, Chris? Yeah, well, I gotta find the link because you know where it is. Uh, it's actually the very next slide. As soon as you go to the next slide, it will play automatically. So don't go to it. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> it seems to be chopping out of the presentation. Yeah, all right. I added, I added a final slide. All right, cool. No problem. Um, so, uh, people ask why I grew a beard. A beard. Well, I started growing it about nine months ago when my wife, Tina, was diagnosed with cancer. It's a secret. Um, don't talk about this online. It's actually a very rare form of cancer. The state, same kind that Steve Jobs had. Um, tumors in her uh, pancreas and liver. You know, we got three little kids and stuff. And then so, you know, this brings up questions of life, death, what does it all mean? Of course, I'm dealing with all this in my own way, in many levels, as you do. But I'm also dealing with it on sort of an artistic level. Like, how can I creatively get through this? How can I channel this unusual energy for myself and maybe for other people? I know cancer has touched many people's lives. I, I know. 
So, I think I want to do some sort of creative art project around this. I think, what am I going to do? Okay, well, some of you know that I love quadcopters, and I, as I travel around the world, I've been getting quadcopter footage from all over the place, and I've always wondered, what the hell do I do with all this quadcopter footage? I don't know what to do with it. And I thought, well, maybe I'll make a project around this idea. I thought, what else do I love besides quadcopter footage? Well, I love the music of Hans Zimmer, who's a mutual friend. Peter, where are you? Right back there. I, I owe Peter my life for introducing me to Hans, becoming friends with Hans. Love that guy. So I listen to his music all the time. And I also listen to the words of Alan Watts a lot. Most of you don't know who Alan Watts is, that's fine. He's a British-born philosopher. Now he's dead. But a lot of his lectures were stored before he died. So what I did is I made this little nine-minute video, you're going to see, where I combined quadcopter footage, the music of Hans Zimmer, and the words of Alan Watts to explore these ideas of life and death. If you're wondering what the current status is, we're, there's been some operations. I like to say we're, we're out of the forest, but there's still a few trees around us. Okay, so we're, we're getting through this. Um, uh, we're getting through this. And if you want to talk after this, like I want to talk, get to know you guys, we don't have to talk about that stuff. We can talk about happy stuff, awesome stuff, photography, love, life, art, all that stuff. I know your sympathies are with me. Thank you very much. But anyway, I made this for her because I love her, and I made it for all of you because I love you too. Thank you. 
I said was exactly the same width as the edge of the knife. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. And they saw that it was seemed to be composed of more small particles. They thought they had come to a certain ultimate wave of course called electrons. But then, unfortunately, everything fought, fell apart and they found protons, mesons, and many other uh, extraordinary things. Because what is happening in all these investigations is through us and through our eyes and senses, the universe is looking at itself. See? It runs away. You never get at it. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. This is the principle. Shankara explains it beautifully in his commentary on the King of Upanishad, where he says that that which is the knower, the ground of all knowledge, is never itself an object of knowledge, just as fire doesn't burn itself. Well, I became a philosopher was that since I was a little boy, I always felt that existence as such was weird. Same sort of experience as when you were born. 
In other words, we all know very well that after people die, other people are born. And they're all you. Only you can only experience it one at a time. Everybody is I. You all know you're you. And wheresoever beings exist throughout all galaxies, it doesn't make any difference. You are all of them. And when they come into being, that's you coming into being. You know that very well. Only you don't have to remember the past in the same way you don't have to think about how you work your thyroid gland or whatever else it is in your organ. You don't have to know how to shine the sun. You just do it. Like you breathe. Isn't it, doesn't it really astonish you that you are this fantastically complex thing? And that you're doing all this and you never have any education in how to do it?